All right. So I guess it's time for our featured speaker. Um, and uh, that's going to be uh, Rowena Mills. Many of you might remember the presentation she did on uh, flute music of Native Americans a couple of years or three years back. Um, that was amazing in both performance and in distribution of information. So Rowena Mills, an editor and flutist, earned three degrees and completed three certificate courses at the University of Tulsa and has taken three Cherokee language courses. I know how hard that is. <laughs> uh, she has had extensive editing experience with specialties in petroleum geoscience and American Indian history and culture. She has edited 25 periodicals and scholarly journals and more than 120 books, including autobiographies of Wilma Mankiller and Russell Means. Her articles, essays, and reviews have appeared in several newspapers and periodicals in the award-winning Oklahoma Indian Markings issue, sorry, Indian Markings issue of Nimrod, International Literary Journal. Mills is former president of the Association of Earth Science Editors, the only international editors group exclusively for geoscience and is active in several music organizations. She is a member of the Long Valley Cherokee Stockgrounds and her subject today will be Native Resources, Salt and Oil in the Cherokee Nation. So, before I start, did everybody get a handout? Okay. And I'm going to put in a little plug here for, uh, I'm editing this magazine, Oklahoma Horses, also Tulsa Pets and Oklahoma City Pets, although we talk about wildlife too. But the November issue of Oklahoma Horses, which is coming out in about a month, will have uh, an article by Carol Mowdy Bond at Choctaw on Lucille Mulhall, a uh, famous uh, cowgirl uh, contemporary of Will Rogers, and also my article on the Cherokee brand book uh, from 1884. When the, uh, and Luke has helped me with some research for this, which I really appreciate. The brand book shows the actual markings that each of the Cherokee ranchers used on their livestock, uh, the cattle and horses. And there's one tiny little copy of it at TU in special collections, and I got permission to use that. So I'll have a little article on that. But you will find names you know in there. Clem Rogers, uh, W.E. Hossel, the Hossel Ranch, Jake Bartles, who's the founder of Bartlesville, um, and others that are still well-known names today. But they were, they were ranching then in the days of the open range. So if you want to pick up a copy, if you can't find Oklahoma horses in about a month, let me know and I'll mail you one. So that's my little ad for that. And I want to thank uh, Bill uh, Shop House for bringing me over here today. I had an eye injury about a month ago and I'm still having some trouble with that. I would not have been able to hold my eyes open to, to drive into the sun at the angle it was today. So I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Shall I sit down? Can you still hear me if I sit down? To read? Okay. All right. So, salt, native resources, salt and oil in the Cherokee Nation. Um, I speak today in honor of my good friend, Patricia Wingate Lockwood. Uh, this is her um, centennial year. She was born in 1922, died in 2005. She was a well-respected Cherokee historian and genealogist. And uh, something she told me was the idea for this whole presentation, so you will see as I go here. Okay, here is a teaser with visual aids. What does this salt shaker and this oil can have in common? Stay tuned to find out. <laughs> Once upon a time in the late 1920s, three little mixed blood Cherokee girls, Margaret, Ann, and Patricia Wingate, went on an outing near Grand River with their mother, Helen LaHaye Wingate. They were looking for the home site of their ancestor, John Martin, the first treasurer of the Cherokee Nation and justice of the Cherokee Supreme Court. 
He lived from 1781 to 1840 and is buried in a gateless, walled plot about a block from the Fort Gibson stockade. I don't know whether the Wingates found Judge Martin's home site that day, but they found something else that they never forgot. More than 70 years later, in 2002, Anne Wingate wrote to her sister Patricia, Do you remember when we saw those huge iron kettle rims lying on the ground? What were they? Where were we? And what were we doing? And Patricia told her. The Wingates had stumbled across the ruins of one of the 19th century Cherokee Nation salt works. You probably haven't given any thought to how salt gets into the shaker or how it has had such a huge role in world history for thousands of years. Salt is physically essential to human and animal life and has many practical, medicinal, and ceremonial uses. Until modern geology revealed that underground salt deposits are more numerous than people thought, salt was one of the world's most sought-after commodities. It has influenced the establishment of trade routes and cities, has provoked and financed wars, has secured empires, and has inspired revolutions. People have scraped salt from surface deposits, used water from salt springs, and dug and drilled wells to reach underground salt water. Various methods have been used to evaporate salt or to mine for it. If you look at a map of almost anywhere in North America, local roads that might seem random and haphazard are in fact widened footpaths and trails originally cut by animals looking for salt or water. Indian Territory was no exception. Salt in large quantities is too heavy for most of the water transport available in Indian Territory. It was necessary to find and develop local sources. After the Louisiana Purchase, explorers and officers reported on the area for the United States government. Major Amos Stoddard was commissioned in 1804 to take possession of Upper Louisiana. He wrote a book published in 1812 in which he described five flowing salt springs northeast of the present, county, co present community of Maisie in the area where Union Mission was founded nine years later. The Osages and the Choteau family knew about the springs and had used the naturally flowing salt water. Other whites, however, founded the commercial salt business in Eastern Indian Territory, installed equipment, and combined the availability of salt deposits with the advantages of river transportation. In 1815, Bernard R. Mool obtained a license for himself and his associates from Major William L. Lovely, Cherokee agent, to establish the salt works at the springs on the west bank of Grand River near Macy. So in your, your um, handout, turn to the second page. Your handout shows photographs from a 1932 article by historian Grant Foreman. At that time, 90 years ago, several ruins of Cherokee salt works still remained. On page two of your handout, the first photo shows a wooden pipe with salt water flowing through it at the Union Mission location. That site was known as Campbell's Salt Works and later Bryan's Salt Works. Campbell's partners killed him on about May 1, 1819, and the works were abandoned for a while. Famous naturalist Thomas Nuttall visited the site in June 1819 and wrote about it in his book. Also on page two, the second photo shows remnants of the Bean and Sanders salt works near Gore. In 1817, Mark and Richard H. Bean established the salt works on the Illinois River near the confluence with the Arkansas River. They made salt for use at Fort Smith and in white settlements because salt was scarce in Arkansas. The Beans purchased kettles from Campbell's salt works and shipped them down the Grand in Arkansas and up the Illinois about five miles and then overland west two miles to a stream called Salt Branch. The next year, the Beans and Reuben Sanders obtained a license from the governor of Arkansas to operate the salt spring. They sold salt for one dollar per bushel. They shipped salt to the whole region on boats that they built and sailed down the Arkansas River. Captain John Bell visited there in September 1820 and described the location. The treaty with the Cherokees in 1828 dispossessed the beans. William Weber, a Cherokee, took over the works, which he and his heirs operated until the Civil War. 
Weber's Salt Works was an important place where public business was transacted, including, sadly, a slave auction that the Cherokee Advocate announced in 1845. On page three of the handout, photo three shows a kettle from Mackey's Salt Works. And on page four, photo four shows Mackey's site with one salt kettle hanging over the water. It's that kind of dark spot on that photo. On that site, 10 or 12 miles above the mouth of the Illinois River, John Lassiter had operated the salt works by 1826. Samuel Mackey took possession of it in 1828. It was on the east bank of the Illinois near the military road from Fort Smith to Fort Gibson. Mackey furnished lodging and food to travelers at the salt works. Mackey's salt works was a well-known place, frequently mentioned in official accounts and other writings. Salt water from a spring came through an opening in solid rock at the bottom of the river. A pipe was fixed to carry it and pump it to kettles on the bank. Mackey died in 1839 and his sons James and W.T. Mackey succeeded him in the business. Before the Civil War, the salt works became the property of Alexander Wilson, a prosperous Cherokee merchant in Tahlequah. It then became known as Marble Salt Works. Wilson died in 1858, and the site became the property of his widow, Rebecca Riley Wilson, and their three children. Mrs. William, Mrs. Wilson died in 1861. During the Civil War, Confederate troops seized that salt works and made the site a public gathering place where soldiers were drilled. They manufactured salt for the use of the Confederate Army and surrounding inhabitants. After the Confederates were driven out in 1863, two companies of federal troops were stationed there to hold the works, the country, and the military road for the Union. They manufactured salt for the Union and the thousands of refugees who had gathered around Fort Gibson. Union forces abandoned the salt works two years later to prevent them from falling back to the Confederates and destroyed the <coughs> equipment. During Reconstruction, the broken kettles from the former Mackey Salt Works were repaired by riveting iron straps to the fragments, as you can see in photo three. It's been put back together, and the kettles were reused for a while. On page four, the, the fifth photo shows the remains of the Bluford West Salt Works. In 1831, Bluford West, a Cherokee citizen, purchased a place with a large buffalo and deer lick on the east side of Grand River, southeast of Shoto. That site had no salt spring, but when water evaporated, it left a saline deposit. In 1832, West and Andrew M. Van dug for salt water. At 10 or 12 feet, they struck a little salt water, but Van gave up and left. Not to be deterred, Bluford West dug four wells and two cisterns that found only a little colored salt water not fit or unfit for use. Then West dug from the bottom of the well 10 feet down to solid rock and then used a drill on a cable, a spring pole with a heavy iron bit. Finally, after two years of painfully slow digging, West struck a vein of salt water at 126 feet down. He used wooden pipes to take the water to vats and then to furnaces for evaporation. Sixty kettles were in use at each of four furnaces, producing 30 to 60 bushels of salt per day. On October 3, 1843, the Cherokee Council enacted a law declaring all salt springs in the Cherokee Nation to be the property of the nation, except the one on Lee's Creek, which the Treaty of 1828 had granted to Sequoia. The Cherokee Nation took control of the sites and rented them to people, and the old settlers filed claims for losses. Bluford West died in 1845. His widow, Nancy, eventually married Leroy Markham, who leased the Bluford West Salt Works from the Cherokee Nation starting in 1860. The best known salt spring in the Cherokee Nation, and I don't have a picture of it, was a half mile south of the village of Salina and was known to whites as early as 1820, but they did not attempt to manufacture salt from it until 10 years later. It became the most important salt works in the Cherokee Nation. That spring and other salt springs were stipulated in the Treaty of 1825 for some Osage members of Colonel A.P. Shoto's family. He acquired title to the springs at that location and in 1830 sold them to Sam Houston, who later, quote, discovered that a white man could not own land in the Indian country, end quote. 
at that point in Grant Foreman's article, someone wrote in the margin, he knew that, of course, meaning that Houston knew he could not legally own land in the Cherokee Nation, but bought the title anyway. After Houston, Houston had to give up the springs, Captain John Rogers, who was Cherokee, took possession of them and called the site Grand Saline. On October 6, 1832, Washington Irving visited there. Rogers himself was dispossessed by the Cherokee Law of 1843. At that time, he had 115 kettles that his son, Louis Rogers, had taken 50 of them to use in his salt works on the Spavinaw. The famous spring at Grand Saline was a naturally flowing saline, which needed only slight expenditure to procure salt water, meaning you didn't have to pump it to get it out of the ground when it came out. In 1844, the Cherokee Nation leased the spring to Lewis Ross for $1,600 per year for 10 years. Ross built what Thurman called a pretentious home at that site, which the Cherokee Nation later bought for use as the Cherokee Orphan Asylum. Other early salt works in the Cherokee Nation included John Drew's salt works at Dirty Creek, about three miles west of Weber's Falls, and one on the Illinois River above Mackey's. Fragments of hollowed sycamore logs used in the salt works have been found at both those locations. Before the Civil War, John Drew sold his salt works to David Van, who operated them throughout the war. Van's son, R.P. Van, later described the big system, cistern that held half a million gallons of water and the pumps that were kept going day and night. Wagons hauled salt to everywhere, he said, pulled by six oxen each. It took four days to make a round trip to Fort Smith with a load of salt at about 25 miles a day. Van said his father charged one dollar a bushel for salt on the ground and collected gold dollars in flour sacks, often from Creek tribal members who were regular customers. After the salt works closed, some of David Van's sons broke up 15 kettles and sold the pieces to Joseph Sondheimer at Muscogee for old iron. The salt works at Grand Saline, Bluford's West, Bluford West's works, and the Union Mission works furnished salt to Missouri, Arkansas, and Indian Territory. Demand for Indian Territory salt was far greater than supply. It was sometimes profitable to take a flat boat with a cargo of salt as far as New Orleans when prices were high. In 1844, six salt works were in operation in the Cherokee Nation, Rogers, Browns, and Vans on Grand River, Weber's and Mackey's on the Illinois, and Guess's salt works, Sequoia's, on Lee's Creek. Sequoia had operated a saline in Arkansas that he had to give up, and he was granted the one on Lee's Creek in compensation. After Sequoia's death, his saline became the property of Joseph Cootie and his son, William Shorey Cootie, and was operated under the name of J. Cootie and Son. It was not profitable because of the lack of a navigable stream of water nearby. Early in 1858, Cootie sold it to M. and W. T. Mackey, sons of Cam Samuel Mackey. The salt works on Grand River could reach remote markets through the Arkansas River and could go by keel boat into southwestern Missouri. But by 1875, in Grant Foreman's words, the mk and Railroad and resultant importation of cheap salt ruined all the salt operations in the Indian Territory. Like salt, petroleum has been around forever. Because of the wide occurrence and unique appearance of petroleum, people have always readily observed it. Oil and gas seepages and springs and deposits of tar, asphalt, and bitumen exposed at ground surface were local curiosities that attracted visitors from afar. From the earliest times recorded by man, petroleum is frequently mentioned as having had an important part in the religious, medical, and economic life of many <clears throat> regions. In North America, including Indian Territory, American Indians used oil that oozed from beneath rocks and accumulated on the surfaces of creeks and springs as medicine for themselves and their animals. Whites began to visit some of the sites as popular health spas. E.L. Drake drilled the world's first commercial oil well in Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859, that same year when Lewis Ross tried to deepen his saltwater well near Neocho Crossing on Grand River, he struck oil. It was not just the seep. It produced an estimated 10 barrels a day for almost a year, but Ross did not have a market for the product or a system to transport it. 
It was not surprising <coughs> that Ross, Ross struck oil when he was looking for salt. The two often occur together. Salt collects underground and on the seafloor in domes, pillows, walls, and other geologic formations, and oil tends to be found around them. On page 5 of your handout, photo 6 shows a cross-section of the salt dome with oil around it. After the mid-19th century, when large quantities of oil were discovered underground, its potential commercial importance became apparent, became apparent, but the use of petroleum spread slowly in the kerosene age from 1859 to 1900. The accepted method of prospecting for oil at that time was called creekology, which was a search for above-ground indica indications of petroleum, such as oil seeps, streams that were coated with oil, natural gas seeps that caused areas to be devoid of plant growth, and tarry water that livestock refused to drink. Several unsuccessful petroleum in enterprises were started in the future Oklahoma beginning in 1872. The first commercially successful oil well in Indian Territory was the Nellie Johnstone No. 1 in Bartlesville, completed in 1897, but transportation and marketing were still problems, and it was capped. When the railroad arrived there in 1899, however, it enabled oil to reach markets and turned Bartlesville into a boom town. In the late 19th century, the first commercial production of motor vehicles using the modern internal combustion engine set off a phenomenal growth in the petroleum industry and ushered in the gasoline age. Although oil is not essential to human and animal life in the same ways that water and salt are, it is impossible to overestimate how much the world has changed because of oil and gas. It isn't just a little matter of using gasoline-powered vehicles rather than horses. In one of the petroleum geoscience courses I took, the instructor, instructor distributed a list of 100 common, everyday, man-made items and asked us to circle those that did not contain petroleum products. There was only one on the list, concrete. The others were things like, you know, plastics, Vaseline, countless others. Oklahoma burst onto center stage in the rapidly expanding petroleum industry and entered the Union as the 46th state at almost the same time in the first decade of the 20th century. Along with the prolific development of petroleum exploration, production, and marketing more than a century ago, a new field of scholarly research and journalism sprang up, petroleum geoscience publishing. That specialized type of publishing is essential <coughs> for dissemination of the science and for news of the discoveries, processes, and products that continue to change the world immeasurably. It is part of the legacy of Tulsa's several decades as oil capital of the world and the historic economic growth of Oklahoma fueled by oil. In 1901, the Sioux Bland No. 1, the first oil well in the Tulsa area, was drilled in the Red Fork field west of the Arkansas River. Then in 1905, the fabulously large Glen Pool field south of Tulsa prompted a rush of entrepreneurs to the area's growing number of oil fields. At 43 square miles, it was one of the largest fields in the world at that time. The oil was high grade and the wells were shallow. The Glen Pool has produced 340 million barrels of oil. In 1905, the future Oklahoma produced 54 million barrels of oil in that one year alone more than any state in the Union in any country in the world. That's because of the Glen Pool. That made Tulsa the oil capital of the world, a designation it held for most of the 20th century, and sparked phenomenal growth in the city two years before statehood, which came in 1907. In 1910, the term black gold began to be used informally for petroleum, signifying the enormous wealth that had been generated in oil-producing regions. Oklahoma's petroleum deposits lie within a vast reserve called the Mid-Continent Region, which includes Kansas, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and New Mexico. For 22 years, between 1900 and 1935, Oklahoma ranked first among the Mid-Continent states in oil production, and for nine additional years, it ranked second. During that period, the state produced 906 million 12,375 barrels of oil worth approximately $5.28 billion. Many other large successful fields were discovered throughout Oklahoma for years. The discovery of the Oklahoma City field in 1928 marked the transition from creekology 
to modern geology, led by several eminent geologists who were trailblazers in the scientific exploration of oil-producing regions. Oil, oil men learned that science held the key to finding oil and gas. Oklahoma scientists were also in the forefront of the petrochemical industry and the emerging science of geophysics. The first successful reflection seismology experience for petroleum exploration were conducted near Oklahoma City in 1921. The school, later called College of Petroleum Engineering, opened at the University of Tulsa in 1928. By 1931, Wilbur L. Nelson and prominent chemist and inventor Dr. Sidney Bourne had joined the faculty. Together they provided the greatest training in refinery production in the world, bringing international recognition to the school and attracting students from across the globe. TU continues to be the premier petroleum engineering school in the world. Many students, especially from the Middle East and South America, are on full scholarships paid for by their government. Many famous oil men got their start in Tulsa, in Oklahoma, and especially in Tulsa, including Josh Cosden, Harry Sinclair, W.G. Skelly, and J. Paul Getty. E.W. Marland, whose company in Ponca City later became Conoco, once personally owned 10% of the world's oil reserves. The Great Depression produced a glut of oil on the market and prices of crude oil plunged but the efforts of Governor William H. Murray and later Governor Marlin to preserve oil and gas resources, even calling in the National Guard, forced <coughs> compliance. Petroleum exploration and production remained strong in Oklahoma through World War II and 41 new fields were discovered in the state after the war. However, beginning in the 1950s, the rate of depletion exceeded discoveries with only one major find during that period. Drilling continued as fields were expanded and secondary recovery operations were undertaken in older producing areas. The Arab oil embargo in the early 1970s and the deregulation of natural gas sparked development of a new basin, new drilling, and a new oil boom area. Once again, hundreds of millions of dollars poured from the earth in Oklahoma. At about, time, at about that time, there were more than 400 oil-related companies of all sizes in Tulsa alone. However, in the early 1980s, the boom ended. After the oil bust of 1982, Oklahoma and te Texas witnessed a free fall in glass gasoline prices and a mass exodus of oil companies, ushering in a prolonged decline. In 1982, Oklahoma, Oklahoma had its first failure of revenue in state history. Eventually, production declined to about 40% of the 1986 level and employment fell. Oklahoma's economy began to recover, but leaders attempted to expand into sectors unrelated to oil and energy. Although many major companies left the state as overseas production began to dominate the world's energy supply, Oklahoma's oil economy had rebounded by the end of the 20th century. The energy industry is still a cornerstone of Oklahoma's economy, producing more than $20 billion in a recent year and supporting nearly 400,000 jobs. Although oil exploration ended in Tulsa County in the 1970s, today thousands of stripper wells are still quietly pumping away in the pastures and rolling hills surrounding Tulsa and throughout the state. So after more than a century, petroleum continues to gush out of Oklahoma. But before all that, a now forgotten industry in Indian Territory found and produced another hugely important native resource, the salt of the earth. So now you know what the salt shaker and the oil can have in common. And who knows, maybe you too will run across the fragmentary remains of the Cherokee Nation salt works. Anybody have questions? Uh, I just had a comment. I heard that uh, the community of McKee, which is down uh, west of was originally Mackey, named for this. Oh, yes, person. I think that's right, yes. And I think uh, maybe when the railroad came through or something, they changed it to M-C-K-E-Y. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've heard that. Does anyone know whether any of those salt works that were still photographed, that were photographed in 1932, is there anything left at any of those sites? I couldn't find any any information on that. 
they used a lot of wooden materials, so some of them were preserved that many years later, but they're probably gone by now. There's a lot of evidence on the lower Illinois, you know, near, um, I guess it's the city of Gore, where, where it joins the Arkansas River of place, you know, things, I think there was an old settler's Cherokee uh, original um, settlement in that area, and, uh, and then there was the salt works, and mm -hmm. a lot of stuff you can probably learn if you could find the right people to talk to that can walk down by the river and tell you the history, but I don't think it's written anywhere. Well, I think that's all we have for our program today, so unless we...